Hi, good afternoon. It's Mr. Lotzenheiser. Today is April 30th. We've made it to the end of another month. Today is 151st day of the school year, and it marks 31 days that we've been doing this remote learning. And tomorrow is Friday, and it's May 1st, and we're getting closer to the finish line. I want to apologize again for yesterday's uh, video not working well and only having an audio set up for Google Classroom for your first couple of questions for your homework activity. Hopefully this video works out a lot better for you and you can use it as a, a partnered resource to help you complete your, your activity. So uh, you can see, hopefully you can see up on the screen right now is your War of 1812 uh, PowerPoint. I'm gonna be using that today to, to reference the questions. And then also if you look at your, your actual homework activity uh, about the Madison administration, the War of 1812, Today, we're going to actually start the war and talk about key developments during the war and consequences after the war. So primarily, uh, I'm going to be talking about the tail half of uh, question two, all questions three, four, five, and I'll even talk about uh, the bonus question a little bit for you. So you should be well on your way to, to think and listen uh, to what I'm talking about in the video and then partner that with the information that you previewed about the activity and you should be good to go. And then if you have any more questions, you can reach out to me by phone or email uh, today or tomorrow, and I can help you with this activity before we move on to the end of the War of 1812 and the era of good feelings that will take us uh, up to a new era in American history, the area of Jacksonian democracy. And that'll, that's about as, about as far as we're probably going to be able to go uh, with our timeline and schedule before the end of the school year. Okay, so uh, you can see that I'm going to talk about why were so many second generation Americans eager to go to war in the early 19th century. When I talk about second generation Americans, we need to we need to remember that obviously there have been people of American ancestry that are living in these now states and former English colonies for many, 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 many generations. The reason why I have them in quotes is because these are pretty much the the children of people that were adult leaders during the revolutionary crisis and then the early American founding. So as we're talking about this, uh, the, 18, the 1810s and 1820s, these are people that weren't alive during the American Revolution and the founding, or they were very, very young. So this is a next generation of American political leaders in government. Uh, the two that we'll probably talk about the most are going to be John C. Calhoun, of South Carolina and Henry Clay of Kentucky. These are figures that are gonna be with us for the rest of our time uh, here in eighth grade American history and, and figures that we definitely talked about in the beginning of the year when we worked backwards and talked about the lead up to the Civil War and then the results after the war, okay? Uh, that'll lead you into question three. Who were some of the key war hawks? What were their primary goals? Four, how close did the United States actually come to being defeated by Great Britain during the War of 1812? And then the hint in there is to kind of talk about the summer and fall of 1814. We'll talk about that today. How did the United States rebound in order to avoid a likely surrender to the British? Five, who's this Andrew Jackson guy and how did he gain prominence and national name recognition during the War of 1812? Why was his victory at the Battle of New Orleans considered incredibly important and also quite ironic in the long run. And then uh, your bonus question, what are the key outcomes that were embedded in the Treaty of Ghent for the Americans and the British? And what is the big takeaway from the War of 1812 for students of American history today? We'll talk about that. All right, so uh, let's start off talking a little bit about these second generations of American uh, leaders, okay? So we said that Jefferson did not really think about the idea of going to war with Great Britain as a good idea, as a romantic idea, even though Secretary of State James Madison um, encouraged him to consider the uh, attack of the British um, HMS Leopard attacking the United States commercial vessel Chesapeake, an act of war. Jefferson chose to respond with economic sanctions and uh, diplomatic um policies instead and and they backfired okay but when when jefferson leaves office and madison becomes the next president of the united states many of these democratic republican leaders that are going to come to congress are going to be young they're going to be very very energetic to do work and they're going to have a swagger about them 
that is going to be um, energetic, but also possibly dangerous. Okay, So some of these second generation Americans are going to see it as their destiny to help create America as a true empire on the global stage. They're going to think the idea of possible war with other countries is adventurous. Uh, it might be their, their moment to have some adventure in their own lives um, because they grew up hearing stories of the defiance of the crown in parliament and protests and demonstrations and, and standing up in militia movements to British troops. Those were early American stories of heroism and bravery and linked to our American values from the revolution. So when you are raised in the stories, the mythology of the American Revolution, and you are a child of maybe some of these great political and military leaders of the American founding, it is quite natural for you to probably want to think, well, when it's my turn to serve in Congress, or if I'm ever president of the United States, or if I lead the government of my own state, I am going to make a mark too. Okay, so the trouble is, is that when people are ambitious, they sometimes look for opportunities to gain some fame or notoriety in places that maybe aren't really ripe for that opportunity to begin with. So keep that in mind. Uh, some of these war hawks like John C. Calhoun and Henry Clay are going to be quite interested in picking a fight with Great Britain or anybody else because they think the United States is needs to stand up on our own two feet and they think it's time for their generation to gain some glory for their uh, young republic uh, now that they're at the helm of the American government and society. So let's talk about some of Madison's initial reactions to the Post Embargo Act debacle. Um, Congress actually tries to reach out to France and Great Britain. And they try to say, look, we would like to become uh, economic allies with one or maybe both of you, but we're going to dangle a most favorable trade status out there as an opportunity. And, and France is really excited about maybe getting this most favorable trade status. But essentially, they're going to limit test James Madison and this Congress of of young American political leaders, and they're going to continue their um, their games and trickery of holding some ships and sailors uh, captive on the high seas, stealing freight and cargo, and essentially they're going to uh, try to take advantage of the United States of America. Uh, Great Britain uh, is not really one to really sign on a dotted line to become an economic partner with this administration. Uh, they're still pretty upset about the feigned, the, the feigned attempts to force them to come to the negotiating table with the Embargo Act. And uh, we're going to have some issues again with impressment. Remember, impressment was uh, the British Navy specifically uh, kidnapping sailors that they suspected to be British deserters uh, from American commercial vessels uh, and, and taking them back into service. Additionally, another problem that we're going to have that complicates things during the early Madison administration is that Great Britain is going to start to provoke the United States along the American frontier. And for the most part, that means it's going to be the state of Ohio, um, the Indiana Territory, and even into uh, the Michigan Territory, or British uh, government officials and military officials are going to give information and weapons and supplies to Indian tribes in the Great Lake region, essentially saying, hey, if there happens to be a war with the United States and you would like to serve his majesty's uh, government and military, uh, then once we put down these Americans and restore to them their rightful place as colonies, we will let you have your land back in the Great Lakes region, in the Ohio River Valley. This can be your home again. And you really cannot fault or blame the Native American Indians for at least looking into this opportunity. Uh, a Shawnee chief by the name of Tecumseh, and you, you probably remember the name Tecumseh. You studied him in Ohio history in elementary. But Tecumseh is a guy that tries to uh, jumpstart these Indian confederacies and alliances that existed, we know, in the 1790s and before that during the French and, uh, and Indian War. They're going to try to get these Indian tribes to come together and say, look, uh, this land was never the Americans. This land was never the British, the French, the Spanish, anyone. This land 
uh, belonged to uh, the great spirit. Uh, and the great spirit had given this land to his children here in North America, all of these Indian tribes to take care of. No one had the authority to give the land away. We need to stand up for it ourselves, fight for this land, and get back to how things are supposed to be. Now, obviously, when Indian tribes start to poke and provoke along the frontier, uh, American citizens in places like the state of Ohio and also in the Indiana Territory and in the Michigan Territory, uh, they're very upset and they need to defend their homes and their property from what is seen as uh, an inappropriate and an illegal incursion an armed invasion and rebellion from Indians that had signed treaties uh, saying that they would give away land for peace and go to specific, specific reservations, or they had fled to Canada. Now, uh, the United States government is going to respond with force. They are going to send U.S. military units in a manner similar to when uh, General Mad Anthony Wayne had come to the Ohio Territory the Northwest Territory, to push these Indians out. Um, we are going to have war before the War of 1812 um, in the state of Ohio, in Indiana and the Michigan Territories, uh, between the United States Army, uh, led by many people, but um, most famously uh, led by General William Henry Harrison, a man that would later take his uh, notoriety from these Indian fighting campaigns before and during the War of 1812, uh, into a successful uh, campaign for president of the United States in 1840. So William Henry Harrison, he becomes the hero of Tippecanoe, uh, which is in present-day Indiana, uh, where there was a great battle uh, between the allied Indian confederacies and the U.S. Army. Um, essentially, uh, the U.S. Army is going to start using total war tactics, similar to Matt Anthony Wayne, um, Tecumseh is forced to push back into Canada and wait and wait for possible British invasion if there was a war later on. So you've got a lot of things coming together that are going to encourage people like Henry Clay, who's on your screen on the left, and John C. Calhoun, who's on your screen on the bottom right, to clamor for war. They're going to take provocation on the frontier from the British trying to get the Indians to fight against the Americans. They're also going to take um, examples of the British impressing sailors on the high seas as acts of war. And these second generation of American leaders, these war hawks, are going to see their opportunity to encourage the President of the United States to ask Congress for a declaration of war. They believe that we needed to defend the honor and integrity of the United States of America, that we couldn't see ourselves pushed around in the global community. And now is the time for us to gain the second generation's uh, badge of honor for defending the American founding now that it is already up and running. They also see this as an opportunity to defeat a weaker British force in Canada. Uh, they believe that if they could take U.S. Army and Navy forces, invade strategic points in Canada, uh, that they would probably be able to drive out the British Army units, and we could liberate the Canadians from British control. You remember when we studied the Articles of Confederation that the, the plan for American government in the articles actually said that if Canada ever wanted to break away or we had an opportunity to liberate her from uh, the British, that they could automatically join the Perpetual Union and they could be, become part of the United States of America. Um, so this is an opportunity for conquest for land and resources. It's going to be very popular with these war hawks. Some people are going to be left scratching their heads, people like the Federalists in New England saying, uh, why should we invade Canada? We just got this Louisiana territory that we're trying to, to settle and develop. Um, also, the last time we tried to invade Canada, they, they did not want to join the United States. How is it going to work this time? So keep that in mind. All right. Um, you see down here on this image that says, we owe allegiance to no crown. This is an American sailor standing on the shores with the star-spangled banner in his hand. He is being crowned with glory uh, from 
uh, Columbia, and she has uh, symbols of the American Revolution with her. She has a liberty pole and a Phrygian cap. Um, Warhawks in Congress are going to sell this concept of going to war with Great Britain in 1812 as a continuation of the American Revolution, that we are being now abused and pushed around uh, in our own backyard by British government and military forces. We need to stand up for ourselves. We need to respond. We need to show Great Britain that we are equal peers in the global community. Now is the time for war. And on June 1st, 1812, President James Madison does ask Congress for a formal declaration of war against Great Britain, and they grant it. Now, the biggest issue that Congress had with Great Britain was the policy of impressment. We know that there was provocation on the frontier, but the U.S. Army at this point had put down a lot of Tecumseh's Confederated uh, revolts uh, in Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio. Um, impressment was the big looming issue. Now, ironically, uh, Great Britain had already formally uh, taken steps within Parliament to make to end the policy of impressment, but that news had not reached the United States of America, and it's kind of hard to declare war on a country and then play takes backsies uh, with Great Britain. Uh, and I don't think anybody necessarily wanted to take that back because you have to remember the Warhawk mentality is that we thought war would be easy. We thought this would be quick. We think that we can fight against Great Britain uh, and be able to drive them out of Canada to stand up for ourselves and, and do that in quick fashion because Great Britain is largely still distracted with wars with France at the time. So this is a, a perfect storm for us to be able to move forward. So you should hopefully at this point be able to talk about second generations, uh, why they were ambitious and eager to possibly go to war. Uh, we talked about the goals of the Warhawks uh, would be to uh, stand up for the honor and integrity of the United States of America, the image of our country on the global stage and the global community, uh, to be able to expand and gain resources and land by quickly invading Canada and liberating them uh, by driving out a smaller, uh, perceived to be weaker force uh, in Canada, British troops uh, and sailors. Uh, we, we again discount completely that Canadians actually want to be part of the United States. And we're going to find soon that when we invade Canada, Canadians are going to fight against the Americans because they're okay still being a province, a, a colony uh, of, of Great Britain. So that's going to backfire for us completely. So you should be able to answer through question three. We're going to talk about some of these battles now. And I'm going to pivot to your resources on Google Classroom, okay? So when you wanna focus on your questions about key battles and consequences, uh, you know that I did give you this particular Google document that is essentially a timeline of key activities and events. You can cherry pick from these as much as you want uh, for some evidence for your detailed response. I think the best things for you to consider are uh, how close we were to, uh, to actual defeat uh, with the British, and that was uh, once the war with France was over, they were able to turn a great deal of their attention, time, and resources towards the United States, and that involved land invasions of the United States of America. Uh, we're going to talk about how we were able to repel some of those land invasions, but the British were quite successful. Uh, they invaded Washington, D.C., of all places, our nation's capital, uh, burning down the U.S. Capitol building and the president's mansion or executive mansion. Today we call it the White House in 1814, which means most of these structures in our nation's capital were less than 10 or 15 years old, and they're being torched and completely burned to the ground. Uh, the president and the cabinet are forced to evacuate and essentially be a, a government in hiding or on the run, something you would might, you might see in a, in a movie today, like an Independence Day when the, the president has to flee and set up a remote temporary government somewhere else. Um, many Americans were concerned that that was the end of Washington, D.C., and in fact, uh, that we might soon be a conquered people um, by Great Britain, and we might actually lose this entire war. But we're going to stop right there for a second. I want to point out some, some resources for you today. 
One, again, if you haven't watched John Green's crash course video on this, go for it because we would probably spend an entire week going over some of these battles and consequences in class if we had the time uh, and the opportunity. We, we clearly don't right now with remote learning. Um, but what I really want you to focus on today is uh, Fort McHenry's uh, National Parks website. Fort McHenry is a strategic uh, fort that was controlled by the Americans. It is outside. Oh, I've got a pop up. It is outside the Baltimore Harbor, which is uh, north of Washington, D.C. And essentially, this fort uh, stood as a barrier to keep the British Navy from uh, invading Baltimore itself. Baltimore was a major uh, city and a major port, major harbor. Uh, Fort McHenry is going to be a holdout, and they're going to withstand a tremendous uh, naval bombardment from the British. And that is not only going to be great for ultimately convincing the British that they don't want to spend the, the time, the money, or the loss of British soldiers and sailors' lives that it would take to uh, take out Fort McHenry and invade Baltimore specifically, but it's going to give us the influence for the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem, written by Francis Scott Key. The, the actual lyrics to our national anthem uh, if you look at the lyrics to our national anthem, they're essentially uh, going through and asking if we survived this uh, tremendous bombardment and will our country survive this bombardment? Will we survive this engagement, the War of 1812? And will we continue to exist as a people and a country going forward? When we get a chance to go to the uh, National, um, excuse me, the uh, Smithsonian Museum for American History, in November, next fall, rather than when we would be going next week on our DC trip, if we were going on time, um, we're going to have an opportunity to see that Star Spangled Banner up close. Some of you have been to DC before and you've seen it. Uh, so we're going to have an opportunity to explore that history in person. That website's tremendous if you haven't seen it already. There's also an accompanying video on the Smithsonian Channel. Check that out. Uh, it essentially tells you the story of Francis Scott Key through his own eyes, uh, the, in, the influence of uh, writing this poem uh, that will become eventually a, a, a ballad anthem for our, our uh, national anthem. Um, this video from CBS News about when the British burned down the White House is awesome. We don't get an opportunity to actually explore the White House in person, on location, when we're in Washington, D.C., but we do get to visit outside and walk around the White House specifically. I'm trying to get this YouTube video to at least pop up so you can see it. This is a seven-minute video that's going to talk about the War of 1812, how and why it began. I think that it's a pretty good partner resource uh, with the uh, video that uh, John Green does for, for Crash Course. And it actually talks about the White House itself, uh, when it was burned down, how much of it was actually uh, salvaged to put into our current White House. And it also talks about the destruction of the U.S. Capitol as well. So really want to point you in the direction there. But for your question, and you look at uh, how close did the United States come to actually being defeated by Great Britain during the War of 1812? Here's a great target response for you after you get done looking at your resources, okay? So one, the United States Navy wasn't strong enough to actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British on the high seas. The U.S. Navy had some really strong naval battle victories on the Great Lakes. In fact, uh, just north of Cedar Point, uh, where you've got um, Sandusky, Ohio, uh, in Port Clinton, we've got the great victory on, on uh, Lake Erie, uh, which was done by um, Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry and many other American sailors and, and ships on the Great Lakes to able to protect our northern shore of Ohio, specifically from uh, a lot of British attack. We did have some British invasion along the Maumee River, present-day Maumee and Perrysburg, Ohio, where Fort Meigs is at. Um, the U.S. was 
was not strong enough to invade and hold ground in Canada. We had some victories there, but for the for the most part, we were largely unsuccessful in Canada because Canadians didn't want to become part of the United States of America. Um, and the British were able to invade parts of our Atlantic coastline, burning down Washington, D.C., scattering our government, increasing doubt in people's minds that the United States was able was going to be able to repel these invaders. And ultimately, a lot of concern. So why did the British eventually want to stop fighting the Americans and come to the peace uh, table itself? Uh, finally, at the Treaty of Ghent, G-H-E-N-T. Ghent is a city in Belgium where the peace treaty was held. But ultimately, uh, the British didn't want to spend any more time I didn't want to spend any more money, didn't want to spend any more human lives conquering the United States of America when they had just gotten done with an incredibly long, bloody, and costly war with France. So that kind of plays on our side. And they realized that they had inflicted enough damage on the Americans that they could probably come to the peace table and say, look, um, let's just return to status quo, meaning we should probably redraw the lines from begin before the War of 1812 as much as possible. Let's just wrap this up. Uh, there were not any battles fought in England, and for the most part, Great Britain was able to inflict tremendous costly damage on the United States of America. Government buildings, personal properties, public holdings, uh, lives lost, money spent, this is going to cost the United States a lot of uh, money to rebuild and recover for a long time. Okay, so you can see some of that reflected in the Treaty of Ghent in your bonus question. Okay, but one really cool thing that I really want to draw your attention to is the uh, Battle for New Orleans, uh, which took place uh, in January 1815. Uh, the British themselves were looking at possibly invading through New Orleans and then a southern or southeastern um, entry into the United States of America to go to war, uh, to, to continue the war and open up um, uh, for a greater attack and land conflict. You can hear my son screaming at me in another room right now. Okay. Uh, the cool thing about Andrew Jackson is that he gains a lot of fame with repelling this British invasion. Uh, I'm going to push pause real quick. Okay. I silenced my son screaming a little bit. I can focus a little bit more on Andrew Jackson for you. First of all, I really want to encourage you to check out the website about Andrew Jackson. This is linked to his, his home, his presidential museum, uh, and a lot of his biographical information in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, his home was called The Hermitage. Andrew Jackson serves as our seventh president of the United States, but before and during the War of 1812, he gains a considerable reputation as being a very aggressive fighter against Indian tribes that were rising up against the United States or somehow resisting uh, signing treaties with the United States government to trade their land for peace. But uh, for Americans, he's going to be the hero of New Orleans. And um, there's a video here. Uh, called the Battle of New Orleans, and it's a song by a man uh, by the name of Johnny Horton, and we always play this song in class, and Mrs. Wilson really likes it. Um, so check that out. Um, it's a pretty fictional, tall tale type of song. We would call it folk a folk song today. But Andrew Jackson gains notoriety in the War of 1812 uh, at the Battle of New Orleans, uh, where he's able to take a smaller American force and keep the British from specifically um, invading New Orleans and opening up the Southeast to a larger British invasion. Now, the ironic thing for your homework is that even though Andrew Jackson is going to become this huge cult figure and icon, this hero of New Orleans, this battle wasn't really necessary at all because the United States Diplomatic Corps and the British Corps at Ghent, Belgium, had already agreed to the principal terms of the Treaty of Ghent. Um, so at the end of this battle, even if the British had probably been successful, the treaty had already been agreed to and needed to be signed by both parties in Great Britain and in the United States 
the land probably would have been returned to the United States itself, but it's already a done deal. Jackson's able to take this uh, now new accolade and fame and grow this as part of his reputation for the American people. He's a defender of New Orleans, and he's a very triumphant victor. And the American people really needed this because we got our butts whooped a lot during the War of 1812, okay? Uh, so he emerging as this great popular figure that's appreciated by American citizens is one big consequence of the war. If you want to talk about the key consequences of uh, the war, if you want to pull up the Treaty of Ghent, this is from uh, the Library of Congress. There's an image of peace between Great Britain and the United States. A couple of cool takeaways of this is that um, uh, the United States and Great Britain, this is essentially the last time that we're going to go to war with one another officially. And, and since the War of 1812, since the Treaty of Ghent, the United States and Great Britain have, have seen themselves grow closer together. And today, the United States and Great Britain are very strong allies. So once a former colony of Great Britain, uh, twice gone to war with one another, and now, over 200 years later, uh, we count on Great Britain, we count on the British to be our allies in economic, political, and military challenges um, as time moves forward across the world. Um, other big takeaways from the War of 1812 is that uh, Americans started to see themselves as understanding and appreciating each other as American citizens. Uh, remember, the American Revolution was largely fought by people that wanted to protect their own state and weren't always willing to sacrifice money and resources or soldiers to go fight battles against the British in states that were farther away from home. They wanted to protect their own turf. This War of 1812 really saw American citizens start to identify and connect with people in different parts of the country, and we're starting to see the roots of something that's going to be a national identity, a national pride, a national spirit that is going to be really, really important as we start talking about expanding into these new lands that we've purchased from in Louisiana and identifying ourselves as Americans rather than just Ohioans or Virginians, Pennsylvanians, and going forward. And then another big takeaway from this is that the Federalist Party is going to largely continue to see be seen by a lot of American citizens as out of touch uh, and not being able to connect with uh, the average American citizen. Uh, many Federalists um, actually opposed us going to war with the British. And to be honest with you, we probably shouldn't have gone to war with them. But a lot of people really bought into the Democrat-Republican idea that we could go to war with Great Britain when they were fighting France. We could invade Canada, gain land, get glory, and grow American pride. So when Federalists in New England um, in 1812, 1813, 1814 start to clamor about, hey, we didn't want to fight the British anyway. They're a huge trading partner with us. We connect with them anyway. Maybe us New England states... Uh, us that are, are Federalist and don't connect with these Democrat Republicans, maybe we should consider having our own convention and see if some of our own states kind of want to secede or break away and create our own country uh, because we tend to think a lot differently than them as well. When word got out uh, that this Hartford Convention was considering possible secession and creating their own country, the leaders of this group, mostly Federalists, we're seen almost as traitors to the American cause of liberty. And the Federalist Party is going to continue to grow in bad reputation. Now, there's still going to be a strong political presence in New England, but we're never, ever going ever again going to have a Federalist uh, president of the United States. There will never be a Federalist-dominated uh, House of Representatives or Senate in Congress. The Federalists are going to exist in the judiciary for a while until they retire or die in office. But we won't even get uh, a Federalist candidate for president of the United States um, after the 1816 election, I believe. And you can double check my uh, cite, citation, but I believe Rufus King is the last Federalist candidate for president of the United States. 
So what does that mean? Well, that means that coming out of the War of 1812, even though we are going to have some big economic challenges, getting the economy back on track, rebuilding things like entire cities, including the Washington, uh, including Washington D.C., our nation's capital, uh, rebuilding the Capitol, uh, rebuilding the White House, uh, people are going to have a confidence and a swagger about them. That's going to be more directly linked to the Democrat Republican vision. Uh, for governance. And the Federalists are largely going to become a shrinking minority to the point of this next era is called the era of good feelings. And the reason why it's going to be called the era of good feelings is because there's only one strong political party in the United States of America. There really isn't going to be an opposition to the Democrat Republicans until we find out later the party tends to have some internal divisions themselves. So, that was an incredibly fast video lesson about the War of 1812. I, I wish we had more time in class that we could do some activities because the amount of Ohio history in the War of 1812 is tremendous. And you can check out some of these key battles on the timeline here. Feel free to uh, take some of them and use them in your guided notes uh, homework response and go for that. Uh, there's also a section in here about the key consequences to the war that you should be able to do and some also some trivia in here as well. Please let me know if you have any questions or concerns today. Check out these cool videos that I embedded in here. Uh, you can email me or call me today. I know that Mrs. Wilson is working on this stuff too. Um, I will talk to you later. Have a great day.